You got to remember prior to the pandemic PPP programs and all the support and printing four and a half trillion dollars, this was standard volatility. It wasn't uncommon to have the VIX the past 30. Um, and we forgot about it. You know, a whole generation of investors forgot or never learned what volatility was. Well, welcome to volatility. And now it's affecting many different sectors with the exception of energy for obvious reasons. But each sector seems to get maligned every second week. And so the whole market's PE is being taken down with the uncertainty around inflation, Ukrainian war. And this has been talked about for weeks now, but there's no safety in saying I'm going to go hide in Walmart, for example. You just lost 20 percent there. That's because the market's trying to figure out what comes next. And, and what does come next, Kevin, because I, I'm sure you get stopped all the time. I do as well by, by worried investors saying, you know, I've just lost millions. Um, you know, how, how do we know if the bottom is near? Have we bought him now? No, generally a bottom, and I've seen this movie so many times before, is you need a big institution to go bankrupt. That always helps. I mean, you have to sacrifice an institution to get this to work because then you get a dramatic flushing of equity positions as panic sets in, margin calls are called in, shorts, you know, uh, are bought, they basically bought themselves in already. And then you get this big leg down, usually it's five to 10%. And that is the bottoming process we need. Now, this time I was thinking it might be in, a, in the crypto space, right. but that's already been decimated. And so it may be something else, a financial services company, or, you know, there was some rumors about Coinbase that, that turned out not to be true, but you, you need somebody's offside somewhere on a leveraged hedge position. You just don't know who it is yet. And they're big. And we're going to wake up in the next 10 days, 20 days, and you're going to find out there is zero. That's a good thing. And I'm waiting for that to happen because we're, we're getting close to a bottom here. Okay. So when that happens, any feeling as to what company it could be, Kevin? What sector? No, I, I, you know, the, the it's hard to say. It, it, there's, it, it's generally, it usually happens in financial services where somebody was trying some strategy, um, a leverage strategy. It's always leverage that does this, and, or or a hedge fund. Hedge funds, a good hedge fund that loses ten or twenty billion. That's also good uh, for flushing, and and that's happened many times before. These are guys that you know, have never seen this kind of a market. So they set up a position that went awry, couldn't unwind their, their, their leverage, and they just get wiped out. Um, and again, you know, I, I feel sorry for them, but I think it's very healthy when that happens. And, we, and the trouble with this correction is it's a slow grind down one to 3% a day. And you don't really bottom till you get that flush. And if history is any indication, we tend to always have a, a, a robuster market around the time of the midterm election. So that would kind of time in perfectly. Yeah, this, I mean, every time is different, but this, this election is around, is going to be really interesting because the, if the polls are any indication, wow, uh, we're going to get a shift in, in both, uh, you know, on the hill is going to completely shift. And so and you would think there'd be some policy moves now by Biden to try and offset the slaughter fest he faces. Let's talk about uh, inflation now because everyone's coming out, you know, uh, Bernanke, Bezos. So let's start uh, with Bernanke, uh, you know, former Fed chair uh, coming out earlier this week. He has a new book coming out also, by the way, uh, saying that, hey, the Fed really made a mistake here. They were late to respond uh, to inflation. Uh, thoughts on, on, on Bernanke's comments? Are you surprised he, he came out with such a statement? Yeah, a little bit. It's kind of a rear view mirror statement. But remember, uh, you only have to go back to 2020, uh, 2021, when the height of the pandemic was ripping through the economy and people had tremendous fear. And not only was the Fed, you know, trying to be very accommodative, but we were also printing four and a half trillion dollars. And so it's not a big surprise that you would have inflation now. That's what happens when you run the printing presses. It's unprecedented to print that much money ever, ever in, in the history of our economy. And so having some uh, inflation, now the big question now is how, what portion of it is the transitory? Let's, let's take a hint from what happened with Target and Walmart. Half of their problems were supply chain issues, the wrong mix of product and increased costs of transportation. So it wasn't that the consumer rolled over and didn't wanna buy anything, that wasn't the issue. The issue was, they really had increased costs in the case of Target, an extra billion plus dollars in just transportation. 
And so that really is something that's transitory. That's not going to be around forever. And so you have to kind of put that into the cake when you're talking about six to eight percent inflation. Maybe four to five percent of that is real, and the mm-hmm. rest of it is short term. And the market's kind of waiting to see which quarter we start to see that wane a bit, maybe come down to seven, six percent. Right. And what what are your, you know, there's there's two sides here. You know, folks who think that the Fed will continue hiking until they get to that comfortable level of, of inflation. And others saying there's just going to be one more rate hike in June and that's it. And they're going to have to reverse course. What's Kevin's take? Yeah, I mean, if you're a real pessimist, it's one more 50 bit hike and then you have to reverse course and take it back 90 days later. I don't think that's going to happen. The reason I say that is if you look at employment, we're at full employment right now. It's really hard to forecast a recession at full employment. And so we're in a really interesting situation here. It's you know, for the real pessimists about the economy, they're saying, well, the consumer spent, they're about to roll over. But everybody I talk to that's selling to consumer, including the target and the Walmart numbers show that the consumer is still flush with cash. It right. takes a long time to spend four and a half trillion dollars. And so we're, you know, each recession is different. And this one is, this is a predictive correction in the market. We haven't actually had the bad news yet. We're just predicting it. So we're pulling down valuations and really rapidly across all sectors. There's nowhere really to be safe right now, with the exception of energy, because energy prices continue to spike and the cash flows of oil companies that that have fallen out of favor. And even the president didn't like pipelines, et cetera. Well, that turned out to have been a mistake. And now we have these exceptionally high four and a half to six dollar gallon prices and consumers are not happy. So, so just one more point on Bernanke. So when he says uh, there should be a period in the next year or two where growth is low, unemployment is at least up a little bit and inflation is still high. Uh, so he says you could call that stagflation. Is, do you agree with that? Is that the proper terminology we should be using? Yeah, that, that's for, for, for his scenario, it is. But I don't agree with that scenario at all. First, I would say, including anybody that wants to make forecasts about when the start of a recession happens, They simply don't know. And nobody knows right now because it's really hard to read the tea leaves in this market. And so the question that everybody, including me, has every day when I see a correction like this, when I see Walmart down 20 percent, for example, which is a a bellwether stock, if I'm if I'm an opportunist, I might put on a position. But what I'm doing right now is I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the big event, as I call it. And you get these events, and we talked about it. That day will be an interesting day to put one third of your positions on. It'll be a day of panic. We'll be down somewhere between two and three thousand points. And yeah, it's horrible to talk about it, but that actually is very healthy. Very, very healthy. You get the PE of the market down into the fifteen range, even lower. That's a tremendous buying opportunity. And I actually think earnings are going to be pretty good into the first and second quarter next year because we're still at full employment. And so, you know, all of these concerns and the the Armageddon scenarios, and these are putting pressure and compressing PEs, but I haven't seen the downturn of the consumer yet. And so you need to kind of see that. Everybody's forecasting it, that's true, and pricing it into the stocks of consumer products and retailers like Walmart and Target, but they actually haven't seen it yet. Something else I'd like uh, your thoughts on here, Kevin. The dollar strength in this tightening environment. In past tightening environments, we've seen reversal. So why has the script flipped this time around? Why is the dollar so strong? I think what's happened is it's a safety trade. I mean, you've really got an unusual situation occurring in Europe with this unwinnable war, it seems. It's going to grind out for years, potentially. And so, obviously, when you think about that, people want to reallocate their currency. And right now, the U.S. dollar is the safety trade. Um, It it is interesting to think about what that means, because it should have shown up in a higher move in financials. J.P. Morgan would be a good example, yet the stock is down 20 percent. And so something's something's fishy, if you want to call it that. Strong dollar, higher rates, and financials turn down 20 percent. That's unusual. That's what I'm saying. This market is, 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 not, is not yet finished trying to find its, its new equilibrium because nobody could, would have forecasted that. There were people just eight weeks ago talking about loading up on financials and energy. Energy was right. Financials was wrong. You basically made no money if you put those on equally. 
what 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 do you say to 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 some experts out there who are saying the Fed um, number one focus is not inflation. It's actually keeping the U.S. dollar uh, and saving the U.S. dollar right now, as we've seen other countries like, you know, Saudi and, and, and looking outside of the U.S. dollar system. And that's why we're seeing this dollar strength. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, it, it kind of, if you try and, you know, figure out the Fed's mandate and how they think before they make their moves, it's, it's, it's the definition of insanity. Because at the end of the day, inflation is their number one mandate. But also, they know they have a delicate situation trying to attempt a soft landing. And what the Fed doesn't know and what every other investor doesn't know is how much of this inflation is real and how much is transitory. Remember, we've never had a global pandemic that's a rolling pandemic. Right now, if I were the Fed, I'd be looking at what's happening in China, which refuses to take Western vaccines and is constantly shutting down cities, millions of people locked in their homes, that is very unproductive. That damages supply chains. You heard it from the CEO of Target saying, you know, this is killing us in terms of forecasting what we need in the back end of the year because our factories are shut down. And that's kind of unique to China. The, the, many, most countries are willing to accept the abundance of Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, which actually works. The effectiveness of the Chinese vaccine whatever that's called, is sort of 35%. So if you're only 35% affected, you're going to have rolling pandemics forever. And so I, I think this has got to get resolved. And I think the leadership of, of China is probably worried about these images of people throwing themselves out of windows and lowering their dogs by their tether, you know, so that they can do their business on the ground 24 hours down. I mean, the whole thing is crazy. But that's something that's got to get resolved because that supply chain directly infects inflation in the US. Until we solve for that, we're going to keep having this spiking inflation. And I think that's something that may be out of US control. Yeah, uh, solid, solid point. One more, one more point on inflation, then we'll move on to our crypto. I just want to get your thoughts on Bezos' attack on, on Biden when it comes to inflation. Was he right to do so? I think everybody has a right to have a voice. I mean, there's a lot of critics. And, and right now, uh, Biden is uh, well, his, his poll numbers are worse than Trump's ever were. So, you know, you've got a really interesting situation here. Uh, people are not happy. I mean, the, the tone of the situation seems to be, and maybe this is Biden trying to placate his party because there's so many different factions. He got hired on a mandate to solve the pandemic. And he sort of got that done. Nobody asked him to turn into himself into FDR and give the whole country a new deal. I mean, they're still talking about a Build Back Better spending bill of $2 trillion. That's sheer madness. You couldn't do this now with inflation at 8%. I mean, why even talk about that? You're doing it to play safe those party members that have not forgotten that they want to spend another $2 trillion. That would be financial suicide. And I think you've got enough uh, anti-Build Back Better within the Democratic Party that it's never going to happen. Meanwhile, you're just months away from a midterm that is going to just completely change the tone of Washington. And that's almost certain at this point. I don't know how that would change. You saw that it seems that every candidate that Trump supports wins. And so that's a very strange outcome at this time when Trump himself hasn't even said if he's going to run or not. He just seems to be a kingmaker. But you have to watch politics as regarding policy. And so if this plays out where there's a big shift in leadership in the House, then you get gridlock for 24 months. And that's probably a good thing for markets, which means there is no policy. There is no tax hike. And on top of all that, the SEC came out with 54 regulatory recommendations. That's unprecedented. And you know there's going to be pushback on that politically. I mean, Gensler's ideas about re-regulating the environment, or and not only the environment, but also business, are extremely unusual and incredibly aggressive. And at a time when the economy is, is trying to be, you know, divined by investors, that's very troubling. I expect a lot of pushback over the next 48 hours on these policy proposals. All right, Kevin, let's talk the crypto space now and the one trillion dollar wipeout basically from the, the space. We know how the narrative goes. Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Terra Luna, Cardano, Solana. No one was spared. No one was spared. Your thoughts on uh, what's happening in crypto right now? 
I think this is actually a maturation process for the crypto market. There's two basic baskets of crypto projects. One, highly speculative tokens, and you could say UST and Luna uh, certainly fit that because they've been repriced dramatically, highly unlikely um, in the context of stable coins, will they ever return to their old prices? Because people have figured out a stable coin should be stable. And that means it has to be backed by something of asset value. Uh, you can note that USDC did not correct that way. Um, in fact, during the period of this mass correction of other algorithmic or um, other quantitative or speculative stable coins that really, really got crushed. Uh, Circle, the company that issues USDC, was able to raise $200 million in Fidelity and $200 million in BlackRock. That's unprecedented inequity for the company. So that's signaling that that type of stable coin uh, is favored by institutional investors versus the others, which look like they're a retail product. So you've got all this speculative stuff. The NFTs have corrected. The Las Vegas side of crypto has had a nightmarish correction. And I think that's very good in the sense that it helps separate the wheat from the chaff or the cream from the milk, if you wish, whatever analogy you want, because the traditional projects have remained relatively stable. Sure, they've had a correction, but it's not uncommon each year for Bitcoin to give up 50% of its value. And that's certainly been the case here. Ethereum, same thing. And so that's the, that's the volatility that will be inherent in crypto until there's policy. And we're going to get, we're going to talk policy in a bit. Um, but I just want to understand a little bit more about your strategy, because in the past, you've been you know, totally transparent with what you're doing. Um, last time you were on, you, were, you, know, you, you said like 20% of your portfolio was, it was in crypto. It was actually bigger than your gold holdings. Now, has that changed at all? Has that caused you to reflect and say, hold on a second here, let me reshuffle? No, it hasn't. Um... I remain um, bullish on, on crypto from, from the perspective of, of productivity. And so I think if you're, if you're buying projects, and I've always said this, Bitcoin is not a coin, it's software, Ethereum software, Solana software, Helium software, Poly, uh, or, or, or Paul and his software, all of these different projects around different sectors of the economy. Solana may be better ultimately for transactional speed because Ethereum is pretty slow. So we don't know which one of these projects is going to win. Right. But the whole premise is that you want these for financial services. And I still believe that in 10 years, crypto will be the 12th sector of the economy, but all the existing tokens will not exist. There'll be many that just go to zero because they were highly speculative. They were fun. Um, you know, they, they had no real intrinsic for financial services value. But if you were to ask me about USDC and say, look, where's the value of that? Well, first of all, you can stake it or loan it at a 4% rolling uh, annualized yield every 30 days. And that's valuable in inflationary times. Secondly, it is a highly effective payment system because I am now accepting payment for goods and services in USDC and very often not converting it back to fiat because I'm simply leaving it in my circle account and rolling it into these 30-day contracts. In fact, I had a really interesting dialogue with one of my banks last week, and I plan on reading the script at the next crypto conference because it's quite interesting. It really says a lot about the banking system right now. Um, I cannot buy more than a 3% weighting in any mandate of USDC because my, my regulator or my compliance department, I should say, treats it as a highly volatile equity, as mm -hmm. evidenced by what happened to Luna, what happened to U UST. So they're looking at that, not differentiating the difference between those two tokens. So they're saying, look, you can put on a 3% weighting. So in, in the case of that particular mandate, that was $7 million. So we moved the $7 million out of the, out of the account into, into a USDC account. And within hours, I got a phone call from the bank saying, what happened to that 7 million? Why didn't we get a chance to bid on it? I said, okay, bid on it. Right now, I'm staking it out at 4% for 30 days. Right. They came back, gave me double B corporate credits for three years at 3%. And I said, why would I ever do that? You're not competitive. You've got to meet me at 30 days for 4%. And then they sent me all the articles about the correction of Luna. And I said, Luna is not USDC. These banks are now finding them getting, themselves getting squeezed because people are figuring out 
they're not advancing enough into understanding how crypto works and their clients, I'm just one client, are moving millions of dollars out of their account elsewhere. And, and, and I, I said to him, look, you can bid for this money anytime you want, but you have nothing of value to me if I have to pay 100 basis, get 100 basis points less and tie up my money for three years in a double B corporate credit. You're not even competitive. You're not, you're not even near what I can get. So there you have it. So, so in talking about people moving elsewhere and looking for other options, let's, uh, you know, factor in, should we see the big Bitcoin spot ETF emerge in the US? We've, we, you know, we've seen how it's cha changed the landscape in Canada. Uh, how far away is that reality for you, Kevin? It's a long way away. That's not what's going to happen first. I think what's going to happen first is we're going to see policy on stable coins. And both the Haggerty bill and the Toomey bill are very clear about what they want in the regulatory environment on stable coins. They want a 30 day audit in both cases, and they want all the underlying assets to have duration of less than 12 months. And that makes sense to me. And I think once they put that law into place, which is an easier bill to pass after the midterms, nothing's gonna happen until after the midterms. Biden is not interested in discussing crypto when his poll ratings are, you know, whatever it is, sub 31 percent. That's not a place he wants to go. So you're going to have to wait till after the midterms. And, 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 you know, guys like Michael Saylor were so excited when that mandate came out, basically saying it was the biggest green light they had seen um, for Bitcoin. Um, so we've now taken a step back is what you're saying. Well, that was 10 percent, uh, you know, of the of pre decline for, for Biden. I mean, I mean, the party that would you think would want to champion this, the same discussion was around decriminalizing or getting uh, cannabis off the schedule one narcotics list. The chance that happens, zero. These are not issues that when you're declining in the polls, you become a champion of that, that doesn't help you. And so, you know, the market's correcting. Biden's facing, you know, close to double digit inflation. People are getting gas at, at the pump going into the driving season at, at unheard of prices the last 20 years. The price of protein is up 20 to 40 percent. He's not sitting around worrying about crypto. So you got to think that through in terms of policy. So nothing's really going to happen. Plus, you've got a lot of different proposals coming out of the SEC around climate change and crypto and Bitcoin mining and and. Right. You know, all that stuff. So it's a very volatile situation. Right and, and you had mentioned, you know, offline we were speaking that there was a huge uh, policy meeting taking coming up in Washington. Uh, anything to come from that? You any any big news we should be expecting, Kevin? Well, the entire crypto world, uh, whether you're, you know, in stable coins or whether you're a Bitcoin miner, Ethereum miner, um, they are all gathering in Washington for two days. And the reason they're doing that is it's the unprecedented number of politicians that are coming to that conference. And so there are panels on pretty well every topic. Uh, this is a lobby group that lobbies for the crypto industry. You've got legislation banging around in New York legislature that would ban proof of work, even in a state that has abundance hydroelectricity, which seems ludicrous. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion around not just Bitcoin mining, but data centers. I mean, the new oil is data and every jurisdiction globally wants to have their citizens data on their own land now after what happened in the Ukraine. So the Canadians have moved their DocuSign servers into, into Canada. Many other countries like Ireland are doing the same thing. So you have this huge demand for data centers and, the, and most people do not want them built off coal burning electricity. They want them built off hydropower and mm -hmm. they want them built off nuclear power. You've seen Biden recommission in California nuclear power plants, Turkey Point in Florida. So these are places where now investors like me are going to build data centers because we know the demand will be insatiable. And on top of that, there's infrastructure money available for this. These are each about $250 million projects. So there's, there is private money available. But the biggest problem we're having right now is getting access to semiconductors to build out these data centers. There are none. And so you have to really partner with some of the Middle Eastern countries that have ownership of semiconductor manufacturing to build anything in, in data centers now. So 
it's getting complicated, but the states that are going to win on this are Tennessee Valley, Florida, Montana, North Dakota. They all have abundance of power and regulatory environments that are pro-business. Uh, Kevin, just uh, just the final point, if we could just focus in on, on Bitcoin uh, for, for a minute or two. Um, you know, there's talk that with some technical analysts calling that, hey, even more pains in store for Bitcoin, that it could possibly head down to 12,000. What do you make when you hear these numbers thrown around? Do you think that this crypto winter will be a long one or any sentiment as to where the market will head now? The forecasts of Bitcoin have never been accurate. No one's been able to forecast its volatility. And, you know, the, the speculation that it was going to be a hedge against inflation was just flat out wrong. Um, and that didn't work. And maybe it will work one day. But I, I, I'd argue that the volatility on Bitcoin is going to remain very akin to what Amazon was for its first 15 years, 30 to 50 percent corrections every 12 months, because there was no institutional support in the early days of Amazon. It was a retail product as people that started to use the service, bought the stock. That's the same right now for Bitcoin. Uh, there is no, you know, people talk about institutions owning it. That's just not true. They don't own any of it and they won't until the SEC rules on it. Uh, there is some institutional ownership in the Canadian market by Canadian institutions because they can use the ETF and equity mandates, but that's Canada. They were the first to allow an ETF with Bitcoin as the underlying. They also allowed an Ethereum ETF. And so those are positioned, but they're inside of equity mandates. The actual ownership of Bitcoin itself remains elusive to the institution because of their own compliance departments. And on top of that, no infrastructure for compliance. There's no way to mark to market into any of these systems, the price of Bitcoin or whether it's levered or not during the day, the way you can with stocks that have been treated that way for decades. So there's so much work to be done.